and welcome to the seventh episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Wednesday, the 13th of April. No, it's not. And in this episode, we're going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also be talking about the latest <laughs> happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages by using the chat facility on the website or the IRC channel. I'm Alan, and joining me this week are Tony. Good evening. <laughs> I thought I'd catch you there. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, are you? You're right? Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usual. You're yeah. wearing your Ogre Camp t-shirt. Yes, I am. The baby uh, blue one. Actually, uh, my mother-in-law came around this evening and she said, have you got a new t-shirt? I said, no, I just never wear this one because I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> uh, good, good. And Mark? Hello. So we're all back. You Yay. weren't yes. you weren't here for a month. Yeah, yeah I, I was at a conference for a month. Wow. Yeah. That's dedication. Cool. Mm. Should we get on with it? Yeah. Go. <laughs> and here are the news the first one is going to be told to us by a man called alan hello that's me uh, so google are forking webkit creating a new rendering engine called blink yeah apparently forking is all the rage at the moment yeah so. <laughs> everyone's doing it <laughs> so um, what's blink uh, well, it's their own fork of WebKit. So WebKit is was originally KHTML, wasn't it? And Apple yeah. took it and created WebKit cool. and gave that to the community, and it's open mm. source, isn't it? Yes. Yep. Uh, For what purpose? Uh, as a browser rendering engine. It used it in their desktop browser, Safari, and their mobile browser, okay. Safari. Mm. Uh, and it's also used by Chrome. Yeah. And the Android browser. If Isn't it basically everyone except Firefox and Opera? And uses uh, yes, except Opera recently announced they were going to switch to it. And IE. Yeah. And IE, yes. Oh, yes, and IE. That other oh, browser. Yes. I keep forgetting about that. So um, the the key part is that Google have been working on this for a while. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't just announced and we're going to do this. They've already done it. Um, <laughs> no, that's Canonical's technique. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and apparently forking allows their, them to streamline that engine down mm. and they claim that they can get rid of some extraneous cro- code uh, about four and a half million lines of code that's quite a lot which is mm. yeah. quite a lot so I wonder why that's been sitting yeah. around there well there's well it's because they've been um when they built chrome they built it to be multi-process so each tab runs its own process and each right. extension runs its own process so things don't if one crashes the whole thing doesn't fall over and then the, the WebKit version, which is currently in development, is going to have that built into WebKit, which Chrome doesn't need because it's got it built into the browser, right. which means uh. that they'd end up doubling up a load of functionality, which they then not need. So one of the things that it's letting them do is not worry about that and just carry on building WebKit for how they need it to work. So will this mean that uh, web developers are going to have to take account of lots of different engines now? As well as as well as previously, they really cared about Internet Explorer, WebKit, and Gecko for Firefox. Now, are they going to well, have to have? There were still differences. Things that were supported in well, that worked differently in Safari to in uh, Chrome to mm. in mobile right. versions of the browsers. I mean, WebKit is still, you know, just because it pulls off, everyone pulls from the same code base or has pulled from the same code base up till now doesn't mean that each browser that implements it doesn't do it slightly differently. Yeah, it still needs to be tested on all those different browsers. Yeah, well, or just, you know, designed to standards and file bugs. <laughs> well, is this, yeah. You know, is this a good idea? Them? Well, it, I, I don't know. In Yeah, in one sense, it seems like the right thing to do because as well as Google then being able to streamline it from their point of view... Um, Apple gets streamlined it from their point of view because they've been still pulling off the same WebKit code base, but that's all that's had to have provision for things like um, custom JavaScript engines because Google use their own JavaScript engine called V8 um, mm. rather than using the one which was previously part of WebKit. So there's had to be stuff in WebKit, which means that you can plug in a new um, a new uh, JavaScript engine if you want to. So now Apple are planning on taking that out. Because Opera have said they're going to use the new Blink. Yes. Well, it's interesting. Initially, when they announced that they were switching rendering engine, they said that they were going to switch to WebKit. And then, lo and behold, Blink's announced, and oh, they're actually switching to Blink. Hmm. So they obviously uh, 
had an idea that this was about to happen. Maybe, yeah. Yes. Um, so that basically leaves Apple using well proper WebKit. And quite a lot of... Um, I mean, for example, you can get um, lo- lots of um, like interface widgets, like Qt has... There's a Qt WebKit um, yes. implementation. So if you want to put a, a little bit of web content in your app, right? Um, then there's a, a, an embedded WebKit bit in Qt, and there's... Mm. Um, I can't remember which company it was. There's a company who's, um, I don't know, there's probably quite a lot of companies actually who use it in their own sort of development environments. Well, the Ubuntu mm. uh, things like the music store that's embedded in various playing applications you presumably uses some rendering engine. I don't know what that's based on. I don't know, whatever the default one is. No. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I do not know. Okay, something Alan doesn't know about Ubuntu. We finally found it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just admitting I don't know. Okay. Usually I don't. Yeah, well, it's, it is a, an interesting development, and one wonders what will happen to WebKit. Presumably Apple are now making T-shirts that say, don't blink. <laughs> <laughs> don't even blink. Uh, but, I mean, well, to be fair, we probably go back to where we were just before Chrome was released, which is Apple is the main player in the WebKit community, but lots of other people use it because it's open source. Hmm. But so, they might they might move to using Blink instead if that's more, you know, friendly uh, for the sort of um, applications that people are going to want to use it for. Hmm. I, I I don't think it. I think we're going to see more of this. I think there's going to be other companies developing their own rendering engines, probably based on WebKit initially, for whatever their specific use case hmm. is, because Google are going to make blink very chrome specific yeah and if you have um a a requirement which is not you know multi-process doesn't need to interface with the the chrome bits or the google infrastructure so you don't need any of that then maybe you'll fork webkit and go off in a different direction Mm -hmm. and so we'll have lots of forks of webkit in the future Yes. Hmm. Well, in other rendering engine news, Yay! Mozilla has started a research project to create a new engine from scratch. But it's not scratch the programming language. It's not it's scratch is. the cat. <laughs> no. no, but uh, interestingly, they have decided to, to write their new rendering engine in a new programming yeah, language. This whoopee. Seemed, I don't know, it's a Does scary it idea, the fact that they decided that not only were was it worth, well, okay, Understandably, it's probably worth them looking at a new rendering engine, bearing in mind that the rendering engine that they're using is Gecko, which is basically what they inherited from Netscape all those years ago. Yes. But the fact that they've said, OK, we'll write a new rendering engine to have a play around with, but no current language is suitable to our needs, so we're going to have to write a new program or use a new programming language um, that's specifically tailored to what we need for this particular project... Which then means you have to write development environment yeah. and tools and compilers and stuff as well. And if you want well. to get people, yeah, if you want to get people involved, well, got... if you want a community to build around it, then people have to learn a new language just for that project. And uh, they've got the money to to do that. I mean, it makes you wonder what what they could be doing if they didn't do this. You know, if they if they actually just switched to WebKit or they switched <laughs> to Blink, Blink, what would they do with you know all that mm. that big pile of money that Mozilla have? Well, they they clearly didn't spend it on marketing because they have called their new rendering engine Servo, which is just the sexiest name on the planet. (laughs) Well, it's not quite as sexy as the name of the language. Oh, go on then. What's that? Rust. Wow. (laughs) Did they they decide against mold and (laughs) fatigue? (laughs) See, one of the one of the problems is that it's actually hard to get um, if you're if you're developing a platform, for example, and part of that you need to have a browser. Hmm. Um, it made sense up until these two announcements were made it made sense that you would make a WebKit based yeah. one because mm. everybody else does and the code is out there it's open and you know there are loads of people already working on it but it's it's incredibly hard to get uh, WebKit developers to work on the core project because they're all already working for Google or Apple or right. you know, X Nokia or, or some of these very large companies and it's actually really hard to get people with you know, core commit rights to WebKit because they already work for these other great big companies. So maybe part of the reason why Mozilla are doing this is so that they can have all of the the knowledge within their own company and they're not reliant on uh, people outside their company who work for Google or Apple or other competitors of theirs on rival products, hmm. perhaps. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
And that's it for rendering engine news. <laughs> <laughs> I know, oh, I'm sorry. No. No. <laughs> there are some cool software projects, however, who are seeking crowdfunding. Yes. Oh, yeah. So what's the first one on the list? Geary, which seeks to build a modern email client for Linux. From the, and it's from the same people who made Shotwell. We have Mutt. What more do we need? <laughs> Indeed. So this is uh, Yorba, who are based in San Francisco. And yeah, they made they made Shotwell and they've made Geary. Um, and it, you know, it basically works. You can you can access your email, and it has a a similar kind of view that you would get with most other email clients. Thunderbird. But it also has a a kind of conversation style view that is similar like to Gmail. a bit like Gmail. Yeah, which you know you might think, well, I don't want to be dependent upon. Uh, Google for my mm. email, yeah. um, so I could have a locally installed email client and point it to my IMAP server, mm. and and I've got the benefits of the Gmail interface without worrying about depending upon them or leaving my data in their cloud. Um, so, in order to develop this further, they've kicked off a Indiegogo campaign asking for a hundred thousand dollars. Right, uh, it's got two weeks left, and they've raised twenty four thousand. Also, so mm. far, I don't know much about the giving patterns of uh, these sort of crowdfunding. It depends projects. on the project, really. Right. Mm. You so know, you some, could get some a rush just, right at the end. Of, often they do rush a little bit at the end. They they do an additional promotion at the end to try right. and you know get them over the over the hump. But it entirely depends on the project. Whether uh, you know games, for example, often peak really early if they're really you know well known mm. developers. Projects like this traditionally that I've seen. Don't tend to do that. <laughs> they slowly right. crawl up and slowly, you know, get towards the towards the the goal. And One thing that I reckon would give them uh, would actually, you know, give them something other than being another email client on Linux would be if they would say they were going to support Exchange. Yeah, because loads and loads of companies use Exchange, and everywhere I've worked with Exchange, I've had to do some horrible hack to get an, an email client on ubuntu that or, can talk to my email or just use webmail yeah or, or yeah the yeah. webmail doesn't, isn't terrible doesn't <laughs> evolution talk to exchange mm. well, only a, certain versions yeah a very old version which you can't get in the ubuntu repositories talks to exchange excellent because mm. nobody so, uses exchange anymore well isn't it partly you know the closed protocols and undocumented stuff or is it well they, it's, it's possible there's there's a, a a thing called dav mail which does something clever and basically creates a local IMAP and CalDAV and CardDAV and then and LDAP proxy to um exchange web services, which is the thing that Microsoft wrote in so you didn't have to screen scrape it, like which is what right. evolution used to do. Yeah, I remember it used to sc- yeah. sc- screen scrape the web interface, yes. didn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's it's possible to write things that talk to it. But, but and the- there is, you know, reference implementations of this out there and you know, if you're going to write a, a new webmail client for Linux and you want it to be amazing and you know get people giving you money for it, then I, I imagine that that's the feature people really but want. You, you well, said there's, web... there's no mention of that on their on their Indiegogo campaign. I mean, they have no, set there's... out what they want to do. Yes. So that's not something that they're planning to do. No. Um, and they've only got a hundred thousand dollars, which actually isn't a tremendous amount. For <laughs> I suppose so. If you think about how many developers yeah. you'd hire yeah. with that. You said webmail market. It's a, actually a GUI. It's actually a desktop, desktop client. application. Fat desktop Sorry, client. did I say webmail? Yeah. I didn't mean to. I meant email. That's okay. I, I could tell what you meant. Um, so, but it is a kind of Thunderbird replacement. Yes, That's exactly. the market yeah. sector it's looking yeah, for. Yeah, it's very lightweight. Yeah, yeah. It starts pretty quickly because, well, probably half the functionality is not there yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's got a way to go. I've tried it myself. And, um, yeah, it's it's not finished. It's kind of disappointing. I it's disappointing that they haven't reached their goal yet. Okay, they've got two weeks left, um, and they're at a quarter of the way mm. through. Um, but I can I can kind of see why people aren't backing it, because do people really need a desktop email client? That isn't Thunderbird. Well, or not? Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, do I mean, people the, the really mutt, need one? The mutt thing is slightly facetious, but there are serviceable email clients like Thunderbird. Yeah. Okay. This would be like starting an Indiegogo campaign to create a new video editor, for example. <laughs> Who a would calculator. Do Who oh. would do that? There are already plenty of video editors. Do you see what I mean? It's, yeah. You know, and but they've made a start, and potentially mm. it could be a complete product. But mm. interesting. Mm. We we'll see what happens. Do you know, right? I would actually give them money if they worked on Shotwell. 
<laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, I like if, Shotwell. If they finished Shotwell, I'd, I'd donate to that, but not an email client. Don't need one. Fair enough. Okay. So the other project is Easy Chirp, which is an accessible Twitter client. This is really cool. It's 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 a, another website you go to, like you'd go to log into Twitter, right? But it acts as a a Twitter client um, and has accessibility features, so that people uh, who use assistive technology can use Twitter more easily. Because apparently the the Twitter interface isn't very good at at, um, at that sort of thing. It's all very mm. rich. Well, most websites are very scripty, well, exactly. aren't they? So things like knowing how many characters you've got left uh, is a lot yes. easier. Yes. Okay, so they're at uh, they they were asking for four thousand US dollars and they've passed that, um, and they're trending towards about eight thousand. Oh, wow! Cool. So the thing the, this this has existed for a while, but because Twitter changed their APIs and knocked out a load of old functionality, um, they end having to rewrite a lot of the code, yep. and so they needed the money to do and that. Four thousand isn't an awful lot of money. No, I think it's just one guy who who develops it. Right. I thought Twitter were being nasty and not letting people use third-party apps. And they're not letting people use third-party apps if they decide that they don't add, that they don't do anything that Twitter's official apps don't do. Right. <laughs> so this is to protect their advertising revenue. Yes. Right. Okay. <laughs> right, well, but this seems like a very worthwhile project. Yes. So it'll be interesting to see. Well, they've already met their target, so. Well, it's got six days to go. Cool. Um, and yeah, it's at four thousand seven hundred dollars. So. Um, yeah, it's, it seems to be going quite well. Cool. Yeah, okay. And finally in the news today, um, a group of companies are ha- complaining to the EU about uh, Google's apps having unfair prominence on Android. Uh, oh, and who are on. these? Hang on, they're, they're, they're complaining about bundled apps. Yes. Yeah, who are these shining examples of uh, justice and freedom? Uh, well, um, the, the, the group is called Fair Search. That immediately sounds like they're good people. Uh, who, among them are Nokia and Microsoft. Oh. Oh. So, right. yeah, basically they're saying <laughs> that... Sorry, I just went to fairsearch.com and got an IIS under construction page. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a little digging, man? <laughs> That's brilliant. So, yeah, basically they're saying that when you get, um, when you get a, um, an Android phone from whoever, um, all of Google's mm. apps are really tightly integrated in. So if you're going right. to use... If you if you get a, a Google phone and you go to use a web browser, you've got Chrome there and you're going to use Chrome. And if you're going to sign up for email, you've got Gmail there and you're going to use Gmail. And the ser- and yeah, Google search is deeply integrated into it. So that gives them, and because they've got a big market share of the phone market, it means that they're getting an unfair advantage in the same, which is exactly the same argument which was used about Microsoft bundling Desktop Internet things. Explorer and Windows Media Player with Windows. And could easily be pointed at Apple and the integration with the iPhone as well. I would dare say it could be. But that's not the target they've gone for at the moment. Uh, no, no, because Apple don't provide search to other services people. which generate revenue, whereas Google uh, do. So when you buy a Google phone for, or an Android phone from a shop, you exchange money with the handset manufacturer. Some money goes to them. Some money goes to the store. Mm. Um, and some license fees for the Google apps goes to Google. Mm. Uh, and apparently some money goes to Microsoft for patent licenses. <laughs> yeah. But from that point onwards, any additional transactions you make beyond that, like the Google Play Store, money goes to Google. Yeah. You know, an, an additional apps you buy, a cut goes to Google. So um, I, I can kind of see why this uh, why this lawsuit has come about. It does seem somewhat ironic, given the people who are bringing it about. Yes, basically, yeah. Google has a greater market share in this area than any of those people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah. they but well, they could take which, Android and strip all the Google stuff out. It wouldn't be much left. You, but... can, you can take the Android Open Source Project AOSP and well, put that on your device. Right. Well, according to this article, it's not so much that it's bundled with Android OS. It's when you license from Google to be able to use things like Maps, you have to have them all and really yes. prominent. Right. So you okay. could ship Android yes. without that, but you don't get to ship Maps and things. Or the Play Store. Yeah. So you lose a lot of it. Yeah. So nobody, it, it's it's bundled in such a way that it makes it it's all Android, or nothing. Android open source in, entirely unattractive for mm. handset vendors. Yeah. Oh, well. I think that's the end of our roundup of the latest news. The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you. 
If you hear something that pleases, puzzles, or piques you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. And remember, if we don't hear from you, we might not have enough content. And that can only mean one thing, more quizzes. (laughs) 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 So we've got some community news. And events. And some events. Um, Dell have released another Ubuntu-powered machine for general sale in the US, and this time it's part of their Alienware range of gaming PCs. Ooh. Mm. Right. That's quite nice, really. Ubuntu's a gaming platform now. Yes. Yeah. They very the marketing is very heavy on the you can get Steam on Linux, therefore there's lots of games. Right. Okay. Yeah, they they kind of messed up there. <laughs> it's it said something like on their uh, their marketing it said something like uh, there's uh, up to 25 games in Steam. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, man. Literally minutes of fun. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But the good news is it's way more than 25. It's up to like 100 and something now. And you can follow um what is it? Linux Steam counter on Twitter to find out exactly how many it is. <laughs> yes, yes. Daily Linux Steam. I think there you it is. go. Daily yeah. Linux Steam. Okay. So, um, can you buy these in the UK? No. Nope. Right. I don't think Alienware was ever a really massive brand in the UK, um, because Alienware was a separate company and Dell bought it mm. some some time back, and it's always been, um, well, it's there. Are, there are people who don't don't buy them because they're you know they're quite overpriced and. You know, um, glowing and yeah, exactly with transparent panels on the side, and And so you know, real hardcore gamers would probably buy um, a desktop machine that they might build themselves. But this is an option. You know, if you're a parent looking for a gaming PC for your kids, you know, you might be drawn to something like this. Yes, right. It's always nice to see you know Ubuntu on mainstream developer, yeah, uh, mainstream uh, vendors. No, it's good to see. Yes. Next in the community news, uh, the Loco Council have announced that there won't be any CDs or DVDs for the 1304 release, as going forward the focus will be on LTS releases only. So the next set of CDs or DVDs will be 1404 in April next year. So if you want a CD, you have to download the ISO yourself and burn it. Yes, although it won't fit on a CD. DVD then. <laughs> so DVD or, USB, or stick. USB stick. Who uses optical media these days? Yes, I know, loads of people do. Um, <laughs> so, so in the meantime, up until 14.04, April next year, uh, you'll still be able to order 12.04. Right, which so is if you're doing supported. an event and you want to give out CDs. Exactly, then. give out. And I would, I would give out 12.04 anyway, because it's pretty robust and yeah. Uh, yeah. still supported. Cool. Yeah. Um, and the next online Ubuntu Development Summit, Developer Summit, rather, is happening in May. On oh, I was going to say on the thirteenth of May, but I imagine it's May twenty thirteen. Possibly, yes, that's what that thirteen is. Yeah, it's, so uh, it's actually on May fourteen, fifteen, sixteenth. Right. So um, if you come on the thirteenth, you'll be a day early. Oh, you will. <laughs> Finishes yes. on my birthday. Ah, there we go. Nicely done there. Well so done. this is the the first of the three monthly developer yes, summits. The more regular developer summits. Yes. Yeah, so we second. had we had the one um, a little while back, which Fence was post-era. really. <laughs> Uh, which was really um, like sprung on everyone pretty quickly. Yes, um, and then yeah, this this is the time uh, in May when we would traditionally have had an in person UDS. Right, um, right. So you know they've listened to a lot of the feedback and uh, trying to smooth it and make it uh, more streamlined for this time. Yeah, well, three days from, sorry, three days from two in the afternoon until eight in the evening UTC. Excellent. So we can basically participate on IRC and Google Hangouts and those sort of things to get involved. Yep. Brilliant. Uh, And a man called Philip Bailu has decided that he wants to get more post and put his address on a blog, on a website, asking people who are using Ubuntu to send him a postcard. Yeah. I thought this was really cool. Yeah. It's kind of a a, a positive, good news, feel-good story. Yeah. Um, Trying to uh, re-emphasise that there are still lots and lots of people Mm. um, of using Ubuntu, using it successfully, and that there's a vibrant community around it, despite what you may read elsewhere on Maybe the internet. Maybe we should Yeah, yeah, one. well done for turning that positive good news story on its head there. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the thing I found hardest about this was actually finding postcards that were local to my area. I went into the local uh, uh, WH Smiths in Farnborough, and I said, do you sell postcards? And they were like, 
What? What are they <laughs> then? You know, tourist yeah. information. Uh, uh, I'm not sure we have tourist information in Farnborough. Oh, so there's not a lot to see, is there? Got to Farnborough no. somewhere nice like that. Do they not well, have... well, no, because it says represent your area of the world. I don't want to go to someone else's area and give a postcard. <laughs> just because they have postcards. Do they yeah. not have? Could you not print one out yourself that's just black and just says Farnborough at night? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take like a picture of your back garden. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think the biggest problem will be to me finding a postcard of my local area rather than actually getting it to him or finding lots of people. But I think everyone should. Maybe. Yes. No. <laughs> uh oh there was an idea brewing there yeah, yeah. but it didn't happen i'll come Excellent. back to that okay so um there are some events as well Ooh. uh up first we've got u cubed 2013 which is the ubuntu and upstream unconference oh. and that's the i think it's the third one and it's held at mad lab manchester digital laboratory in manchester uk um, and it'll be on the 21st of april from 10 till 4 um, and it's pay what you want ticketing. Mm. So you go to Eventbrite. That's a idea. We'll do links and things. And the talks are aimed at all levels and they're, sp- they're split into um, user space and kernel space talks. Um, yeah, sounds cool. good. It's always yeah. been a popular event in previous years and I'm sure this yeah. year will be yeah. no different. Yeah. Mm. So it's the third U cubed. So is that U cubed cubed? Uh, yes. Yeah. No, it's the power of nine. <laughs> <laughs> You have to think of nine words beginning with you. <laughs> <laughs> give me a give me a minute. <laughs> and it's Les Pounder's dog's third birthday. Make Munich in uh, which is a German make affair is in Munich in Germany on the t- <laughs> surprise surprise. Yeah, well, you know, it could be a different Good place one. for it. Uh, tw- <laughs> yeah, give it, give it, it's called Make Munich. It makes sense to have it in Munich. Uh, it's on the twentieth to the twenty-first of April, and there's a website we'll put in the show notes. Cool. And finally, for the events this time round, the Ubuntu UK Raring Ringtail Release Party will be <laughs> held. <laughs> indeed, will be held <laughs> wearing winged. <laughs> will be held at the Old Thameside Inn in London on the 25th of April, which cool. is a Thursday evening. Excellent. Um, which, you know, is great for everybody who lives in London. Yeah. Well, as we always say, if you want to uh, have uh, Have event, your own party in your own area, <laughs> sit, in your, <laughs> sit in your own garden with half a can of cider, <laughs> and you're CD. more than welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, that's the end of our show. Uh, join us next time when we'll be interviewing Michael Hall about core apps for Ubuntu Phone. We'll go over your feedback and we'll have some gooey love. Yeah, I think our Michael Hall interview could be really interesting because there's been a lot of talk about core apps on Google Plus and things recently. Yes. Mm. Yeah, excellent. Right. Should we have some uh, cake? Yes. yes. And some tea? Yes. yes. Right, let's do that. Bye. Bye. Bye.